Chapter 37 I told Lupe the next day about bumping into Jason's mom at the mall. So what'd you do? She asked. Nothing. We just left, I said. She looked surprised. You think we'd hang out with her? I asked. I don't know, she shrugged. Maybe you guys went shopping together. Aren't you guys always trying to find a good deal? I hated it when she lumped me and Jason together. It's not guys, it's guy, singular, I told her. I like a good deal, sure, but I don't screw people over. Lupe looked around at the ground and didn't say anything. I started to feel bad, but I didn't apologize. I needed her to know Jason and I were not the same. In class, we had wrapped up our China unit, thank God, and moved on to other countries in Asia. Who could tell me another place where a lot of things are manufactured besides Asia? Mrs. Douglas asked. A hand shot up. Canada? Someone from the front row asked. Mexico, Mrs. Douglas announced, ending the guessing pretty quickly. I glanced over at Lupe, who looked like she wanted to crawl under her desk. Many of the factories there are called maquiladoras, and they make things for cheap, Mrs. Douglas explained. How cheap? Another kid asked. Very cheap, Mrs. Douglas said. She told us that some maquiladoras, it's some maquiladoras, workers made as little as 50 cents an hour. This struck me as hugely unfair, and I immediately raised my hand. How can they pay their workers so little? I asked Mrs. Douglas. It's supply and demand. Anytime a lot of people want a job and there aren't that many jobs, the salary goes down, Mrs. Douglas said. I thought about Mr. Yao's comment when he first came about how 10,000 other immigrants would take our job in two seconds if we quit. Okay, kids, Mrs. Douglas announced. We're gonna play a little game. It's called Hot Seat. That got my classmates' attention. They all sat up straighter in their seats, only to slump back down seconds later when they realized Hot Seat was an educational game, not a game game. Here's the way Hot Seat worked. Mrs. Douglas picked someone at random to represent the Malquiladoras. That person had 10 minutes to prepare his or her opening statement. Then. They had to sit in the hot seat and answer tough questions from the floor. The rest of the class was the floor. The harder the question, the better, Mrs. Douglas said. With that, she reached into her hat of names and pulled out a piece of paper. Jason Yao, she announced. Jason groaned. Slowly, he pulled out his pencil and started writing out his statement while I sat next to him, jaw locked, eyebrows furrowed. He was going down. Good morning. My name is Jason Yao and I represent the Malquiladoras of Mexico. My hand shot up in the air. Hey, jo Jason protested. I'm not even done reading my statement yet. Fine, I said. I put my hand down and waited with bated breath for him to finish. Jason droned on about how big factories were and how many t-shirts and umbrella stands they would made every year. As soon as he finished, my hand shot back up. How does it feel to squeeze your workers for every last cent they have? I asked. I don't squeeze anyone, Jason said. You pay your workers 50 cents an hour. I'd call that squeezing, I said. I glanced at Mrs. Douglas who gave me the thumbs up sign to keep going. They don't have to work for me. Nobody's forcing them to, Jason said with a shrug. But they don't have a choice. They have to feed their family, I said. Well, that's their problem, Jason said. My hat classmates' heads bounced from Jason to me like it was a tennis match. What if you were in their position, I asked Jason. If I were in their position, I'd appreciate having a job, he said. He looked hard at me. Wouldn't you? My cheeks burned. I glanced over at Lupe. As usual, her mouth was clamped shut. I turned back to Jason. 
You need them just as much as they need you, I said. Without them, you wouldn't have a factory. Yeah, so? So why not pay them more, I yelled. Why do you always have to take from them? Take, 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 take. Every time I said take, I lunged forward in my seat. The other kids joined in and soon everyone was chanting, chanting, take, 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 take. It's not my fault, Jason shrieked. It's supply and demand. Mrs. Douglas, help. Mrs. Douglas stepped in and took over, freeing Jason from the hot seat. As Jason crawled back to his desk, Mrs. Douglas turned to me and said, Boy, that was really something. Well done, Mia. I had no idea you were so passionate about Malquiladoras. I didn't either. I caught up to Lupe after school. Hey, how come you didn't help me back there? I asked her. Lupe shrugged. Didn't look like you needed any help, she said. She turned and started walking home. I felt the sting of rejection. What was up with her? I wondered if it had anything to do with what I said earlier. When I chewed her out for lumping me and Jason in the same category, had I gone too far? I kicked the rocks on the side of the road and decided to take the long way home. About halfway back, I wandered into a shopping plaza where there was a pizza hut calling to me at the end of the buildings. I stopped and peered in. Usually, just looking into a restaurant filled me up. All those smiley people, families sitting down for a delicious meal together. We didn't get to eat out much in China because family meals were usually at my grandmother's house. But the few times we did go out, it was pretty funny. In China, people do not split the bill. It's considered very rude to do so or to not pay for a friend. As a result, people routinely get into fist fights in restaurants as customers pushed and shoved one another for the bill. As a kid, I remember it being hilarious to sit there and watch grown people fighting. Sometimes the fighting got so bad, the waiters and waitresses would have to squeeze in and break it up. Sometimes it would take the whole pack of waitresses just to pin down one person. There was absolutely none of that going on at the Pizza Hut that day. Everybody was civil. There was no shouting and no fighting. People were splitting the bill right down the middle. I guess that's because in America, it's to each his own. Maybe that's why Lupe didn't stand up for me. Maybe it had nothing to do with what I said about me and Jason. Chapter 38 Jason glared at me the next day. I could feel his anger vibrating off of him. I put my head down at my desk to avoid having to look at him. But when I looked up again, I noticed he was twirling a pencil. He was always doing this, but then I noticed it wasn't just any ordinary pencil this time. It was my pencil, the one my dad got me. Hey, give me that, I said, nearly jumping out of my chair. But Jason quickly held the green, sparkly pencil beyond my reach. I waved my hand frantically so that Mrs. Douglas could see what an emergency this was. Yes, Mia, Mrs. Douglas said. Jason stole my pencil, I said, narrowing my eyes at him. The words shot out of my mouth, sizzling hot. Mrs. Douglas turned to Jason. Is that true? Jace, Jason, expert faker that he was, feigned shock and outrage. Of course not. Mrs. Douglas, this is my pencil. I would never take anything from Mia. Liar, I exclaimed. That's enough, Mia, Mrs. Douglas said. Both of you, up here now. She motioned with her finger for the two of us to come up to her desk. I stared at my sparkly pencil in Jason's hand, which he clutched tightly with his sticky, sweaty fingers as we walked over to Mrs. Douglas. Is this about what happened at Hot Seat? Mrs. Douglas asked. No, Jason blurted out at the same time I said, of course it is. He's mad I won, I told Mrs. Douglas. So he had to take the one thing, the one thing. Tears slammed into the back of my eyes as I tried to get the words out. You didn't win. There's no winning in Hot Seat. There's only sitting, Jason said. Give me the pencil, Mrs. Douglas said. Jason handed it to her. 
I watched as she turned it 360 degrees. Hmm, I don't see any name on it, Mrs. Douglas said. That's because it costs $5.99, I told her. That wasn't a pencil, that was practically jewelry. You can't just write your name on a piece of jewelry. Exactly, which is why it has to be mine, Jason pointed at me. You really think she can afford something this nice? My job dropped. What a thing to say. I'm afraid without a name on it, we can't tell for sure whose it is, Mrs. Douglas said. I sucked in my breath, preparing for the worst. Mrs. Douglas was going to keep the pencil for herself. I should have known. She probably had her eye on it for days. There's only one thing to do, Mrs. Douglas said. Break the pencil in half. I gasped. How could she suggest such a thing? But before I could say anything, Jason shouted, No, don't break the pencil in half. Let her have it. Mrs. Douglas smiled. Now we know who the true owner of the pencil is, she said. I held out a trembling hand. Jason, she decided. Mrs. Douglas said that because I took so long responding to the proposal of breaking the pencil in half, I could not possibly be the rightful owner. And Jason, with his touching, heartfelt plea on behalf of the pencil, must be the rightful owner. So the pencil was his. It was the stupidest, most unfair thing I'd ever heard, and I had to bite the inside of my cheeks to keep from crying. On the way back to our desks, I turned to Jason and asked in a very small voice, Please, Jason, can you give me my pencil back? It's very important to me. He thought for a second. It's important to you, huh? He said. I nodded. Jason held my pencil up as if to, forgive, to give it to me, and I reached my hand out to take it. Then he whipped the pencil back, stuck out his tongue, and licked it. He licked my beautiful, sparkly pencil up and down with his nasty, evil tongue. I was so startled, I made a noise that came out as a half snort and half chirp, which only made him laugh. He stuck the pencil in his pocket right as the bell rang. School was over, and Jason walked off with the nicest thing I had. Tonight, read chapters 39 and 40 independently, then add to the discussion.